Hi guys, this is Michael from the Board Games Chronicle. Today I would like to discuss with you a little more in details Triumph at Marengo, a game by Bowen uh, Simmons from Histogame. I already did the unboxing and first look at this game. Today we'll really deep uh, dive pretty deeply into this title. We'll discuss the rules, we'll discuss how they combine how they are interdependent one with another. We'll go through the map, we'll go through the maneuvers, we'll go through the attacks, uh, through the morale and so on. Based on this uh, short material, you should be able to play this game. And in my next uh, video, I'm going to do the example of play. And so I believe this will be a whole package of free materials. First look at rules explanation and example of play which will give you everything about this a really great game um, i can add a personal comment here that i'm truly fascinated with this system this system is not using any random factors although you can bluff in this so in order you know to lure your opponent into uh, some some actions so it's not like fully open information however there are no there is no randomness here it can put off some of the players i know on the other hand we hear so many times that oh my dice change something in the play not here here you have uh, almost everything under control and uh, you should be able to prepare for any consequences when um, explaining the rules, we'll be using the, of course, rulebook. Triumph at Marengo has a decent rulebook, which is, I believe, not so many pages long. It's, uh, yeah, it finishes here. It's like 10 pages long, although mm, it's not a big font. So there's a lot of information and a lot of examples. So I really hope to bring them to you. And, and, and show how they are, uh, you know, done. So we'll go step by step through, through, through what we have in instruction and explain it. So let us start. First and foremost, we might uh, start with two sentences of historical background. So this is a battle which happened in uh, 1800. Uh, so so uh, it was when the Bonaparte was still very young, although already assessing his power over French and French military too. The Marengo is uh, actually here. The Austrians will be attacking from here, you can see. Here we would have some French set up, they will be disorganized. And from those directions we would have the reinforcements coming. Historically, initially, the Austrians crushed the French. Then uh, the main general of Austrian forces thought, OK, we are done. We crushed them. Uh, I'm not needed anymore. My deputy, please continue. Go on, finish the routing French. Unfortunately for him, the French managed to bring reinforcements and actually crush the Austrians. Uh, some of uh, people say it was a brilliant victory by Napoleon, but many more say it was just a pure, pure luck. Let's start with the playing pieces. I have them all sorted here for French, which are starting on the map, French reinforcements, Austrian uh, who are uh, entering from here. And you have also some additional you know, pieces as a spares or reductions because you will be uh, killing killing each other pretty pretty heavily and yeah here you have a spares so now let me tell you what is what this is the symbol of infantry as you can see and this shows you a three-step infantry with a two-step infantry and this will be one step infantry and of course this is a blue one so this will be french the red ones are the austrians and the same, they follow a similar three, two, one steps in front. Then we have cavalry. This is the cavalry. How does it look like? You have two strength cavalry and one strength cavalry as, as, as a reduction. Last but not least, very important on the battlefield is the artillery. This is a French artillery. 
and uh, it will be coming uh, from 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 uh, reinforcements and you have also the austrian uh, artillery which will be also coming but not in the first turn from here from alexandria uh, other than that uh, we have the morale tokens which will be showing the commitment of both forces you would have committed and uncommitted morale and you have turn marker which will go through all those steps. All in all, the game lasts 16 turns, like 16 hours, from 6 a.m. till 9 p.m., actually 10 p.m. Uh, in the evening, and then you go through all those, those steps. It's hour by hour. So, of course, if it's one day battle, you would not have anything like supply, so, so forget. Supply is not important in, in, in this game, I think. Uh, yeah, so these are the pieces, we'll be setting them up in a moment, but before this, uh, let me tell you how to win this game and what's the goal. There are two ways to win this game. One way is to crush the enemy so badly that it has zero morale left on the map or uncommitted part. So this is one way to win, and then it's automatic victory for the other side. Or, if till the end of the day, none of the armies is disorganized, so I still have some morale. We look here at this line, and this line shows us a marginal victory for Austrians, whether it was achieved or not. If they have at least three units behind this line, they will achieve this victory. If they don't, they simply failed to, to do it. Okay, so we know the playing pieces. Now let's have a look at the map. Map is pretty unique. It actually uses the color coding even this red and blue, but also the map here of the 19th century, you know, generals. Um, it has some additions to this, of course, but, but in, in, in principle, uh, this is the approach uh, which is followed here. <clears throat> and, uh, okay, what do we see on the map? First of all, we see polygons. As you can see, these are, you know, the polygons which are kind of a locales on the map. Uh, this is not point-to-point -point, uh, map. This is also not a completely free-for-all, like in the figure battles map. No, there is some order put here because of those polygons. And, 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 and those polygons actually show you how, how you can move. Uh, so... Uh, let us have a look at some particular polygon, for example, here. This is a big polygon, or oh, that would be even better. So if you look at the polygon, what do you have here? In the center, you have a reserve. This is a place where we would have uh, units which are in reserve. Let me show you, maybe based on French. That would mean that the unit is in reserve. Then you would have one, two, three, four, five, uh, four approaches in this particular case. And if unit is here, that means that it is blocking the approach. So the reserve, the approaches. As you can see, uh, there are some symbols here. And those symbols would simply mean that there is some penalty if there is an attack going through this, uh, you know, um, uh, approach. This means the infantry uh, infantry penalty. You would also see other like uh, cavalry penalties. I believe, uh, yeah, cavalry penalty would be, for example, here. Artillery penalty, this is here. There, there are also symbols which shows you that uh, this is cavalry blocking. Oh, cavalry blocking is here, like here. And there are also things which are impossible. You have all of this very nicely put into in the rule book, which tells you about infantry, cavalry, artillery penalties, impossible terrain, and cavalry uh, obstructing yeah, uh, approaches. So the polygon approaches reserve in the center. Over this, you have also some other features which are important, like roads. These are the main roads, you see. And there are also minor roads, those smaller. There is nothing like town or city in this, in this game. However, if you look at Marengo, you can see that all the approaches to Marengo have penalties on infantry, on cavalry, and on the artillery, which means 
this is the way to show that the terrain is more difficult. The same for this river here. You can see a lot of penalties. Two penalties for cavalry, two penalties for infantry. This is huge penalty. So, okay, we have already polygons uh, uh, discussed. Now, let me take some options. These two are opposing approaches. Yeah, so this is important also to, to, to understand this. And if you look, this is a wide approach with two dashes. This is narrow approach. In order to block a narrow approach, you need one unit. In order to block the wide approach, you would need two units. In this situation, this approach is fully blocked by French, but only partially blocked by Austrians. It will, of course, have some impact on the fight, on the maneuver on the attacks and so on and so forth but enough for now to know this is this is how does it look like here we would have the setup of the french and this is a kind of a, a random setup which is really nice you take all of the french from here you shuffle them and you put them randomly so each start will be different you do the same thing for the reinforcements so let us do this now at the beginning of the game. So we put all the units here. We'll shuffle them. And then we'll be using them for the game purposes also. Yeah, so this is it. This is how we do it. And these are our uh, starting units. This will be our reinforcements. Once you shuffle them and put them on the map, of course, French player can look at them. The Austrian cannot. So this will be there. And the setup, we also have like three uncommitted French morale already here. And then we would have also Austrians. There's a lot of them. And uh, the artillery cannot be moved in the first turn. So I might not want to put all of them here but mainly only part of them just for the demonstration purposes. Maybe a couple of those too. Okay. Should be enough for now. Uh, yeah, the third one. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, one more feature on the map which I would like to show to you is this rectangle, which shows actually uh, approach direction. It points west to east, uh, and it shows that French should not retreat this way, and the Austrians should not retreat this way, unless there is no other way to do it. So let's put French on the map. We would do it that way that you put everybody as a hidden, and you shuffle them, yes, as much as you can do. Two are coming here, one is coming here, one is here, two are here, and they are disorganized. I will talk about it in a moment. This is the way to place the units on the map. And Marenko. Um, also, you should probably see this number here. This shows maximum number of units in each polygon. So, for example, in Marengo, maximum is three, but on this large, maximum is 20. Uh, okay, this is how we set up it. And then the Austrians will be coming here through this bridge, through this road, and through this pontoon bridge, and trying to overwhelm the, the French. What else do we have on the map? So I told you this would be the reinforcements part, so we can also shuffle the reinforcements. It's really important which reinforcements you will get because they are not all coming during the same time. So once you shuffle them and put them here, a lot depends on, 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 on those reinforcements. And some of the strongest ones you would probably would like to have as soon as possible. So Austrians are here, French reinforcements are here, French at the setup are here. What else? This is turn track. You will see that we will be adding morale this, this red, you know, rectangles will be added here, yeah, all of them, and then red and blue, yeah, and they will be put here to uncommitted morale. Here we have also the 
mm, legend in French, I believe, yeah, it's French, beautiful. Uh, not that I speak French, but you have also everything in English in the rule, so don't worry. But it's very, uh, I'd say, thematic to have this map done, done this, this way. Uh, did I miss anything? Uncommitted morale, turn track, legend, uh, uh, the starting French, the reinforcements. I believe we have a map discussed. Yep. I believe we have a map discussed. We have victory conditions discussed. So maybe let's go to the sequence of play. So for the sequence of play, I'm also using one of the materials which are on the board game geek, a great player aid, which shows you which things happening in which order. So like scheduled morale cleanup and approach cleanup would be at the beginning, then we'll have the actions, then we'll have morale cleanup. So in essence, this is how, how the, the game is played. Each side is doing his, her entire action before the other player will do theirs. So we go uh, that, that way. And for our actions, we probably should start, uh, yes, uh, with, with some basic information. Each player has three action in his turn, and uh, as per common rule, only three units can be activated, up to three units per, per, per each action. There are some free actions, like move on the main road or defensive march but in essence uh, you 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 will have uh, those three actions to, to 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 perform one unit can only perform one action per turn unless this is reorganized action which at the beginning all those french will have to undergo to do something uh, meaningful otherwise they are pretty pretty useless and uh, of course basic rules you need to finish one action before you start another action and uh, yeah you need to do this in order but you can also exploit if one assault breaks uh, for example um, some some approach you can exploit it then with some movement uh, yep uh, i believe we'll start with uh, um, with, uh, with the marches and there are two types of marches there are off-road marches and Road marches. So road march would be through the roads, and off road march would be, for example, like here, because there is no no road here. So uh, let me use those French, for example. Okay. Let's assume they are organized uh, for the sake of an example. Uh, um, for the march. It's important to note uh, that uh, you need uh, to take all the pieces for the march uh, from the same local end position to the same local end position. This is very important. And off-road march can be from reserve, and from this reserve I can move either to this uh, to the approaches or to the reserve which is adjacent remember this is not adjacent this is only corners which are adjacent so this is not adjacent the adjacent locales to this one is that 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 and that so i can move from reserve to reserve of the adjacent locale or to the approach but in order to move to approach you need to have enemy there so for example something like this in order to go to approach you need to have enemy uh, enemy here and it would cost you one action tricky thing is that there is something called uh, a defensive march which is not costing you anything but only if uh, your move results in moving the minimum number of units needed to block the approach so in this case if i would like to do off-road um, uh, march with uh, any of those units, this is free of charge move. This is costing, uh, no, no, wait, this is the weight approach. Let me show you a better example here. This is free of charge because we are able to, to, to uh, block it already. This is not free of charge move, it costs you one command. So, to repeat the, the off road march from reserve, you can do to the reserve of adjacent empty 
locale or to the approach adjacent to local occupied by enemy. You can also do the off-road march from the approach. If you are in approach, uh, you can do uh, two things. Let me show it to you. We can either return back to the reserve here or move here. So if you are at the approach and for some reason there is no more enemy in front of you, they retreated or did something else, you simply can move either to the reserve here or to reserve here, so either here or here. Those guys cannot move here because there is, uh, uh, there is uh, enemy there, although they would be able to attack there, but they cannot do the off-road movement, they can only retreat back here. So these are the off-road marches, pretty useful uh, because you can you can always do this, let's say, uh, let's say move and, and, and gain better position. Another example uh, of the marches is um, a road march. And this is a very interesting thing uh, because uh, in essence, you can move three hexes with off-road march. Let me get some free units. This might be those. And this was one of the things which I was maybe not struggling, but trying to understand how it is. Let's say we are on this road, yes? This is the main road. So we can move one, two, three hexes, or hexes locales, sorry to say this. One, two, three. And there's also road here, so we can move one, two, three. You see, this is the road. Now, if our whole move is on the main road, it costs zero command. If our move is using also the secondary roads, it will cost us our one command. Now, the funny thing, and something which I really like in this system is that we had traffic jams when moving in columns uh, through, 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 through those roads. It's not possible for those three units to travel simultaneously. So what happens? It, it happens that way. We would like to move all these three units this direction to here. The first unit moves here, those two units wait. This unit moves here, that can move here, fantastic, that unit waits. And then this moves here, this moves here, and this moves here. And this is how the, the, the uh, move, uh, uh, road movement works. You cannot move all three units here. There is traffic jam. Those guys need to wait. When this is here, those to wait. When this is here, that can go, but that can, uh, needs to wait. And only then you can move them like this. It's very important to plan your moves correctly because this mechanics can really mm, make some trouble for you to bring reinforcements quickly. So for example, sometimes when French comes, it's not a bad idea to allow one reinforcement to go here and the other go here to go, you know, in, in, in uh, parallel paths, but with a much faster speed. And yeah, uh, one thing which is important during the road movement, this is cavalry. And cavalry is a pretty quick and special unit. This unit can, during the road movement, let me give you some example. Can, during the road movement, attack the enemy and continue the move. In this case, because the Austrians are in the center, in the reserve, this cavalry can do the road movement uh, with, with uh, maneuver attacks. So move one, attack here, they will need to retreat. I will explain later how the maneuver attacks work. And move here. So one, two, three. And in this step, of course, manage, manage to, 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 to uh, maneuver attack against those, uh, those, those uh, Austrians. So cavalry during a road march can attempt to step into an enemy occupied uh, locale. So this is the only, the only exception. Of course, if we would have them blocking it here, uh, this is white, they would not block it fully. But for example, some area where we have a narrow approach. Yeah? Most of them are definitely white for those large. Uh, but here, yeah, if we have such situation, we move one, two, 
free, they can attack, but if they block the approach, no way for them to attack. Remember one thing, it will get much uh, clearer once we show the example of play. Cavalry can attack during the road march. Okay. Uh, I believe that's enough about the movement. We had a movement of road movement, so like here, and we also talk about the road movement. Now let's talk a little about attacks because this is what you wanted to hear. Yeah? So <clears throat> how does it work? First of all, we would need to create some situation of attack. Uh, let's assume with such frontier. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's do it this way. Okay, how the maneuver attack works? You would probably already think, okay, it has to do something with the move. Yes, it does. It's type of attack, it's attempt to take and just an enemy occupied locale by simply crossing an approach uh, in, in this locale, which is not blocked. So for example, if we have such situation, those units here, cannot try maneuver attack here because it's blocked but they can attempt to attack here and let's make situation even more complicated let's put it like here so we have here the austrian blocking this approach here we have austrian in the reserve here we have a french blocking this approach and here we have the, uh, uh, the, the, the french in reserve and let me get one more here, oh, that way. So, assuming this is a French turn, they would like to do a maneuver attack. They need to do the attack declaration, and in this attack declaration, they need to show what is the attack locale, it will be here, and what is the def uh, uh, defense locale, it will be here. <clears throat> this is the Attack approach, this is a defense approach, yeah, this is pretty, pretty clear. Uh, so, uh, what is the second step? The second step is that the defender can't, uh, can respond. In this case, if a defender is in reserve, they can choose to advance. So they can advance here and block the approach. Uh, once the approach is blocked, we, or there is a response from, from defender, there is a result determination. And this is uh, very easy because the defense approach is, uh, if, if uh, attacker wins, if there is not blocked you know, um, approach, the defender wins if they manage to block. Simple like this, very simple, no die roll, but only the checking whether it's blocked or it's not blocked. In some cases, we might not want to block it because I don't know, there is another French looming on us here, and we might want in our you know, movement retreat from here, for example, here in next move. So we might want not, not to block it, but you don't know what's the situation. In all in all, uh, the, the attacker is swinging, and uh, when this is not blocked, and the defender is winning when they manage to block it. There will be slightly different situation on the white approach, uh, because it might be, for example, only partially blocked. Let's do slightly different situation, like this. In this case, if they attack here with, for example, one unit, the Austrians can try to block, but this is only partially blocked. Uh, so the attack will be blocked here uh, in case of a partially blocked, uh, let's say, approach. If there's exactly one attacking piece, and this is the first maneuver attack across the approach this turn. So in this case, if there's a situation, they try to attack here, this is stopped, but if another attack goes here, they will manage to get into, into this locale and those guys would need to retreat. Because if the attacker wins, all defending pieces in the defending, uh, defense locale must retreat. If attacker won, the defender pieces remain in place. That's all, yeah. So in this case, which we are showing here, 
we had such situation, they moved here, they moved here, and they blocked. We showed only the attack from maneuver attack from reserve. Much more nasty thing is when we attack from approach. In this case, if French would like to attack here, those guys cannot stop them. They are too far away from this approach. If they attack from reserve, they have time to react. If they attack from approach, they don't have time to attack to react. They need to retreat and they will take losses. So remember, maneuver attack can be very tricky. If you somebody approaching your locale with your unit like this, either move here and block it or retreat from here because you can be attacked. Okay. Second type of attack will be bombardment. We should have it here. This is this is interesting yeah, way of attacking. Let us assume we have such units here. Okay. How does it work? This is a two-step uh, two-step uh, uh, attack. Normally, you don't show units which are here. Yeah, both sides don't see the units. So if you attack with your artillery, turn it and say, I am bombarding this place. And this is what we are doing in this turn. So this is like a declaration of bombardment. We show it, we leave it like this. And during the next turn of Austrian player, and we will have bombardment competition. If there are still units here, the enemy would need to show one of the units and say, okay, they are hit. We change them to one piece. Yeah, this is the way to, 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 to take a hit. And uh, yeah, remove, remove one unit. And also they will lose morale. So two step, um, two step attack. In one turn, we simply announce we will attack, we will bombard. In the second turn, we actually attack. So the enemy has time to retreat. And if they retreat, we don't need to fire. We can say, okay, nobody here. Instead of complete the bombard, maybe I will move to reserve so I can attack somewhere, somewhere else. That way. And now I believe we'll go to the most difficult but the very important um, uh, type of attack, assault. I told you that if it's blocked, maneuver attack is unsuccessful. But there is a way to, to, to go through, through such, um, let's say, blocked approach. And this would be assault. Let me just organize the units properly. I need for the example purpose couple of units i need this unit and i believe i need those two units okay example would be the best way to do it on defender i would need this i would need one cavalry okay and would i need anything else uh, i would need a very weak opponent. Okay. Okay. So we assume we have such situation. Kind of a difficult situation. There is no way for the maneuver attack to succeed here because yeah, it's blocked and <laughs> you have really a lot a lot of units on both sides of approach. So how do we do the uh, assault? First of all, there is an assault declaration. So um, let's assume this is a French turn and they say, we would like to assault across this approach. This will be our attacking locale. This is a defensive locale. Fine. So this is a, the second step. The defender, defender has to declare his pieces who will be defending. Uh, attacker will have uh, some of his pieces. The defender will have uh, all of his pieces taking part, but some of them will be leading pieces. In a narrow approach, he can have zero or one. In a wide approach, zero, one or two. Mm, so, and if there is cavalry obstructing, so like here, they cannot use cavalry, but let's not go there. So, Defender 
would you like to have any leading pieces who will be actually defending? Yes, we would like. This would be our leading piece who will be defending against this assault. Why we want to do it? Because each leading piece will then eventually inflict some casualties on the attacker. Now it's time uh, for the uh, attacker pieces declaration. And they need to declare who would be their leading pieces, the assault part. On the narrow, it can be one. On the wide, it can be one or two. Uh, but uh, I believe strength minimum two or three. Yeah, two. So they say, OK, this will be our leading piece. And this will also take part in this, in this assault. And this one will not take part in assault. Now you might ask, and when I was first playing the game, the question was, why I'm saying this guy also takes part in assault, although I will not use his strength? Because if we win, both of them will advance. And that guy can stay here and still guard this approach. So if we say all of three of them takes part in the assault, if we won, all of three of them will need to go. If we only use one, only he goes and he can counterattack. So while we not immediately use this second guy here, who we declare also part of assault, he can be useful when we, for example, manage to crash through this approach. But of course, if we say both of those guys assault, or both of them actually use this one uh, action per turn limit. And of course, this guy potentially, after this assault is unsuccessful, can do his assault later on. So this is the leading piece for the defender. This is the leading piece for the attacker. This piece also takes part into this assault. Fourth part is artillery defense. In rare cases, but there will be such cases, if there is an artillery of a defending side, it can be shown. It's here. And it can fire. And it will reduce the uh, attacker by one piece. So let me do the reduction we should have here and here. Let's count it here. So one hit on this unit due to the artillery defense. The fifth step of uh, <clears throat> assault is potential defense counterattack. If they have uh, in the units taking part in assault the cavalry, oh, they have. They can flip it and say, OK, we are counterattacking. What happens if they counterattacking? First of all, they take one step loss. Yes, seems counterintuitive, but will be important later on. And they will be adding the strength. Uh, artillery once fired, we, we hide. It will be adding strength to the total value of the units defending. And also uh, later on in the loss. Sixth, the sixth step of the assault, told you this is long, but later on it gets pretty intuitive. We need to calculate the strength of both sides. First of all, we total the strength of attackers' leading pieces. This is two. We subtract one for each infantry or cavalry penalty in the defense approach. Here is the defense approach. This is uh, infantry, that means that this infantry is less effective, so this is 2 minus 1, 1. Then we subtract the total strength of a defending leading unit. This is 1, so it's already reached 0. And we subtract the total strength of a counter attacking pieces. This is that 1, this is minus 1. <clears throat> so let's add up. 2 on attacker's side, on defender's side. This penalty, this and this, so it's 2 minus 3, minus 1. Minus 1 means the assault failed. In order for the assault to succeed, it has to be positive number. So simply, uh, the attacker needs to have more uh, strength uh, when we can uh, calculate the resolution than the defender. As I told you, uh, when explaining this theoretically, it might uh, seem uh, seem complex, but in the actual play, it's much more uh, it's much more intuitive and easy easy to, to understand. Okay, <clears throat> so we know that the assault failed, but we also need to calculate the losses on both sides. 
Each side will suffer one reduction for each enemy leading piece. We can see that there is one leading piece here and one leading piece here. So they got one hit. Let me take from here. And they will also got one hit. They are destroyed. Simple, simple like this. Uh, the attacker takes one additional reduction for each surviving counter-attacking cavalry piece. So they survived. So this is also dead, actually. And uh, there is a rule which seems complex when you read it, but when you understand it, you actually yeah, yeah, get it. Uh, on attacker loss, uh, if a negative of the attacker loss, let me read it, if a negative of the result is equal to the or greater than the total current strength of attacker's leading piece, then add one to the attacker's reduction total. So, in this case, let me show you what we have here. Based on this situation, we would inflict two losses on the attacker because of this unit and this unit, and one loss on our strength because of this leading unit, yes? So, two reductions on the defender side, one eh, on the attacker side, one reduction on the defender side. Uh, this is important. So this would be like minus one. Minus one, because we uh, deduct uh, mm, uh, the, the total losses uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, defender minus losses of attackers. This is minus one. This minus one, negative of this, or simply how badly the attacker uh, was defeated in this, this, this assault is not greater than their current strength. It's simply this rule says if you are beaten so badly in this assault as an attacker that your, uh, let's say, differential of losses uh, versus the defender is so huge that it's higher than your strength, you will add additional loss, but not in this case, there is no additional loss. So two hits here, one hit here, and actually this is the situation after the battle. How does it look like? A huge, huge, uh, let's say, losses. And there will be a morale uh, consequences to this about which I will tell you in a moment. Okay, but before this, uh, we need still to discuss two things. First of all, I would like to talk about cavalry continuation. This is one of the things which I have not touched upon yet, but this is really a cool thing. It has, uh, cavalry has ability of continuation. What does it mean? At the end of a maneuver attack, at the end of a successful assault, at the end of a road march, at the end of an off-road march, they can um, actually get to the approach which uh, faces the enemy. So for example, if we have if we have enemy here, the regular uh, off-road march of this unit, the infantry would be here. From reserve to reserve, or if they are here, from the approach to reserve. Cavalry can do more. They can move from reserve to reserve and then do the continuation and get here. So actually, to, uh, to the approach uh, facing the enemy. Similar thing, if we have a road march, let's assume there is enemy here, and we have cavalry here, they can move one, two, three, this is regular road march, and then they can do the continuation and block this approach. Similar after the attack or after successful assault, if they, for example, manage to crash those guys back, they need to retreat, I don't know, here. This cavalry does not need to occupy the, uh, the uh, reserve position, they can immediately get to approach. This is second example showing how cavalry differs from uh, infantry in this game. First was, uh, uh, of course, ability to do a maneuver attack during the road movement. Second is continuation, there will be third. And the third one will be connected to retreats. 
Let's do some example of retreats, some bloody battle. Uh, I need for this uh, artillery. Where is artillery? Here is artillery. So, some small narrow approach uh, would be helpful. Uh, let me show something to you. Maybe here. Okay. Let's assume we have such situation. It's slightly too small to show all the details. So maybe here. Let's assume this. Let's assume some cavalry. Let's assume some infantry. It could be very weak infantry. We don't mind with one step. This would be here. This would be here. This would be here. Mm -hmm. And now. We have such situation. As you can see, the French are defending pretty nicely in this area. Uh, they have uh, a lot of strength here. Let me just change it a bit. Oh, that way. They have a lot of strength here, like five units facing two units. Should should not be any problem with this, yeah. Two units here to one on approach, one unit to one here, and two in reserve. However, what happens is that in the course of play, the Austrian cavalry or any other unit sneaks here, and then somehow French did not react, and they attacked here, and they attacked either from reserve or from here. I don't mind, you know, maneuver attack. They attacked here. They are unopposed, so they actually won the battle. Now, all French has to retreat from here and take losses, take reductions. How do we calculate them in this case? If attack, it, it, it could be assault, it could be maneuver attack, but simply they need to retreat. And I put so many units here to show you all possible examples. How do we calculate uh, the losses? First of all, all artillery in any position is eliminated. One loss. Then, in each approach, so here, the pieces blocking the approach take uh, one reduction if approach is narrow and two reductions if approach is wide. Uh, actually, that guy would die, and that one would be uh, reduced. Yeah. Third thing, infantry pieces in reserve takes a total of one reduction. Actually, if there is more advancing units of uh, enemy, it would be even more, but in this case, it's one unit. We take a reduction. And cavalry in reserve takes zero reduction. This is very important. And this is also special ability of cavalry to screen the retreats because they take zero if they are in reserve. In this case, those two units will escape here because they can't escape to the um, local from which the attack came. They can escape here or escape here if both are, of course, empty. If they cannot escape, they would be destroyed. In this case, the cavalry goes here, but of course, after successful attack, they can do the continuation immediately. Yeah, they can stand here and again threaten them. So you see, guys, it it seemed a very strong position of French, but when attacked properly through the approach which is not blocked, the losses can be huge. And let me show you once again this great cavalry ability of, of simply blocking the retreats. So we have a situation, the Austrians, for example, are trying to retreat. Huge French army is going here, doing the maneuver attack. And this uh, cavalry, which is in a reserve position, is not taking any losses. We just can, you know, escape. If there would be any other unit here, they would, they would take losses, but <clears throat> the cavalry in reserve position is kind of a screening uh, the, the, the retreat and never takes any loss. Very, very cool mechanics. Okay, guys, uh, there's a lot of additional small rules in this game, but I would like just to touch upon one moral. 
Yes, Morale. Morale is a way to win the game. As I told you, each turn at the beginning will be getting the Morale. And the Austrians, for example, at the beginning of this turn will get two Morale, which we put to uncommitted. Then, if it's French turn, they would get one Morale. And each time we see those symbols at the beginning of uh, this player um, turn, uh, they would be gaining this Morale. And this Morale? is uncommitted but then during the gameplay it will be landing on the map and it will be actually used for some commitment of the troops to defend or to attack depending on the situation and if we manage to destroy all morale of enemy we will win uh, will win uh, the game so what's called here this is so-called scheduled moral updates so what i was showing to you here in mass, uh, my player aid schedule player schedule moral updates players move uh, time track tokens to uncommitted morale area so they move it move it here and uh, now how do we commit the morale there are i believe a couple of things in which you commit uh, the morale one of these you remember our maneuver attacks? Let me do it here. So in this case, the French try to attack the um, Austrians. They react. They won. They won the maneuver attack. They commit one morale from here to here. Why? We are fighting for this area. We won this battle. This is important area. We committed our morale here. So while we succeeded in repelling the attack, now if we lose this area, it will have a hit on us. So you see, this is how we commit the morale. Now, if a defender wins the assault, we had one assault, for example, here. So let's say that both guys are attacking here. And they manage to stand here and, and win win this battle with assault. They commit we commit morale here, and we commit this morale because now those guys who defeated the Austrian attack are you know, motivated. Our brothers died here. We cannot allow the opponent to take this area, so we commit morale here. And uh, yeah. If Austrians uh, are forced to retreat, they will also commit a morale because they should attack. So let's say we have very big Austrian, you know, group here, and a small, I mean, so small, a small cavalry hits here, forces them to retreat. Of course, they will take losses. They have morale committed here. They need to retake it. They cannot retreat. They were supposed to attack. Now, the morale is not immediately lost when, for example, here the next assault succeeds and moves here, or I don't know, uh, they, they will be moved here. No, only at the end of a turn, we will do the so-called uh, morale cleanup. So in each locale, in which there is our morale and enemy, or the enemy was last to be there, we lose this morale. And uh, also, if there's a situation like here that we have fight here, but they retreated, and there is no enemy adjacent to the area of morale, this morale will move to uncommit because there is no enemy anymore nearby, so we don't need to defend this, this, this area. In essence, that means that you, if you lose the locale with your committed morale, you have one turn till the end of your turn to get it back. If you don't get it back, end of the French turn, this is destroyed. It goes totally out. End of the Austrian turn, it goes out. And if there is no more morale on the map and in uncommitted, the side will lose automatically. There is additional way uh, to uh, lose morale. Uh, first of all, for each reduction, an army suffers from artillery bombardment, from retreat, 
or as a loser in assault for each reduction, guys. This is a huge, huge penalty. So in those assault, I believe in our the assault, which I was showing you, the whole free strength unit of French was destroyed. That would mean free morale destroyed. So we need to be careful, very much careful, how we are playing here and how we manage the casualties. So each loss in retreat, also this big retreat which I was showing here to you, each unit, not unit, each strength step loss there was one morale hit. Of course, there is plenty of morale, like 12 or 15, so there is space to take losses, of course, but this is not immediately available. You see the morale is growing for French slower than for the Austrians, and that is why French at the beginning of the game has to survive. You have one, two, three, four, five, plus those three, eight morale, in the first five turns, they cannot take too much losses. Otherwise, uh, they will they will not survive. And uh, yeah, yeah, when we lose the morale, first of all, we lose morale here from the uncommitted side, and then we can lose from the map. Opponent will decide where we lose this morale. Okay, guys, I believe you now get some flow of the game how it will play, what mechanics we have. Remember, we can move either off-road movement or road movement. But if we attack, we can either maneuver attack, assault if approach is blocked, or bombard. Very important is that the losses, when we need to uh, retreat from the locale, can be severe, especially if we have too uh, many units. And that if we are winning as a defender in the maneuver attack, in the assault, we are committing morale to defend it. And Morale is actually the bloodline of our army, which keeps us organized. And in that, in that way, you know, uh, leads us to the, to the victory in the game. I really like this game. It plays each time slightly differently. And I really would love to show you an example of play, because that would be the best way to put all those rules, which I just presented a moment ago, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, to play. All those assaults would be so much easier to understand. All those maneuvers by cavalry, all those road movements, also how the uh, reinforcements will get on, on the map, how we'll get with a French disorganization. I, I have not touched upon this, but I will do in my gameplay. Uh, I would like to stop here, guys. The material is already almost one hour, so that's, I believe, enough uh, to, to, to digest for today. Uh, soon I will be shooting the third material, as I told you, the example of play exactly how the uh, Austrians will be getting here, how the French would try to defend, whether they defend here or maybe move a little back uh, to have closer to their reinforcements. Again, Triumph at Marengo is really great design, which I appreciate. It plays quickly, it plays completely differently each time I sit to this. It's a beautiful game. You can see that aesthetically, but it's also looking fantastic. So strongly encourage you to try this. Uh, really, really worth time and worth investing yeah, 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 your time into this. That's all for today. In this video, I want to familiarize you with the Rules of Prey for Triumph at Marengo. Hopefully, you will find it useful. Uh, uh, if you like it, give thumbs up. If you'd like to uh, see more content like this, kindly please subscribe. The next material in the series, so the example of play, will be published pretty soon. Uh, hopefully, everything will get much clearer than when you see the actual action. Maybe we'll do also some strategic tips for this game, which I believe will be, will be really interesting. Thank you for today and thanks for watching.